evening. Welcome to Chris Park in Shooting Sports, the uh, Tuesday night live question and answers. It's been, uh, ooh, it's been, must be about five or six weeks since I last did one. Been very, very busy. Uh, lots of reviewing other videos to make, testing jobs, this, that, and the other. So, when um, the usual world of uh, written journalism carries on. So, uh, if you're here, thank you for joining me. And um, please um, comment because it's your questions I'm here to answer. Although there are a few props around in front of me, they're a bit of a, a conversation starter perhaps. Uh, it's all about answering uh, or me helping you with any topics you might want to, uh, to hear about. So please, um, my laptop is to my side here so I can refer to questions. Um, we don't yet, touch wood, seem to have had any technical issues this time. So we shall see. Let's just wait for the um, laptop to refresh and keep up with the questions. Nice to see Pulsar advertising yet again on one of my videos, which I rarely ever do for Pulsar, if anybody. A um, bit of a pard fan these days, so uh, it's good to see. So um, just to give you a little rundown, just to get it started before we get some questions coming in, what have I been using this week? So, well, let's go to the, the, the one laid down first. Number one, don't forget, we can't touch any, uh, any guns on this video and it's a little bit tricky to see them laid out flat without handling on screen but I've got an FX Impact Mark III Bronze. This time I've got the um, UK spec uh, sub 12 foot pound version which runs exactly 11 and a half foot pounds and is extremely consistent shot to shot. It's also incredibly quiet. Um, I've just been calmly sort of twiddling here with it with the, with the trigger on the bench before we started and it um, it's just not noisy at all. So <laughs> That's a, a, a quiet thing. That's going to get a full review done soon. Um, I did have the Mark II about six months ago, which was in FAC version, which of course has got a bit more tunability. This the the barrel things like that. So got a little bit less adjustability because of course you've got the legal twelve foot power limit for the UK. Uh, we look like we've got some questions popping up, so I shall have a look look over here. Uh, Thomas, uh, how do you like the bolt handle of the Steyr? It's different. Um, I quite like it on a sporting rifle. Okay, might not be as fast as something uh, a bit more teardrop, etc. The bolt shaft itself is incredibly smooth in transit, and I do like the fact that um, you can close the bolt, lock the safety catch, and shut the bolt down even further, which completely locks the firing pin. So it's a very, very safe system. Uh, the set trigger option as well is incredibly light. Some people like that. I'm not personally a fan of set triggers, a bit too light for me. But that breaks, it, um, I weighed it and it varied between, I'm trying to remember what it was now, I think it was 1,005 to 1,014 grams uh, measured over five, you know, repeat pulls on the, uh, on the lineman measuring gauge. So uh, it's incredibly consistent trigger, but we'll answer a little bit more about that in a minute. So yeah, quite like it. Vic, hey Chris, loving the content, keep it up. 22LR semi auto wise, such as AR15 style, 22. Oh, isn't that accurate? Purely a ammunition dependent. Well, I think accuracy is so much dependent on how you interact with the rifle. Uh, semi auto 22s, two I've done CZ512, I've done an awful lot with the MP1522, uh, Ruger 1022s. Personally, if I was going to go semi auto, as much as I'm kind of not an AR. 15 guy i do like the mp1522 uh, i use them a lot at work and they are just they're so easy to live with you know you've got the flip up sights you've got plenty of picketing you're able to put additional sights on screw cut moderators this that and the other they handle great you can have them in different colors i mean what's not to like the magazines are freely available and the other thing i like about them is because you can ease the spring tension on the mags it's just so much faster to load them Whereas on, you know, something like a 1022 mag, you've got to force every round down against the spring spring tension, spring pressure. So I quite like them. Um, in terms of super accuracy, well, you've got two big, two big hurdles. You've got the same level of consistency from the ammunition you'd have with any bolt action rifle, but you've also got the fouling issue. Do you go for the sort of oily ammunition like SK, which works well in them, but it's quite an oily, oily finish and you do end up with sort of very grey, leady thumbs. Um, or do you go with something a little bit more waxy like the Ely's or the Winchester's, things like that? Um, again, that's part of the joy of Tutu Rimfire. Try your own, test them all out, have a go. There's none of them are bad rifles, but they all have such, you know, because I shoot so many rifles, I really look at the tiny little nitty gritty details because I have to find something that kind of pops them out into my, uh, 
in, into my current sort of sense of interest is in this one does something really really tiny that no one else does and you think wow that's different about it anyway right um Flatline, hi Chris, just getting started. Uh, do you think some of the Pulsar thermal rifle scopes have too low a base mag setting? Well, in terms of base mag, we're talking what is sort of referred to as optical magnification. I don't, I, th I think I'd rather have a little bit too low than a little bit too high. But on the other hand, of course, all the digital magnification on anything uh, you add gives you a lot of pixelation. And as much as they like to say it doesn't, it does. Um, OK, the higher end units have got some superb image quality. But personally, for general all round hunting things, um, ratting, I probably wouldn't start below, you know, above a four. Um, foxing, I can very much handle a six or an eight to start with. And I, I certainly wouldn't want to more than double either, to be honest. Um, but it's horses for courses. I do think they get quite muddled in all the specifications and they offer an awful lot of options. And I've known it in the past when a shop's referred someone to me to tell them about all these things. I've told them about it and then they've gone back to the shop and the shop have just sold them the most expensive one because it's the most profitable for them. So, you know, you have to do your independent research a little bit and it's not always best to take the advice of the person making profit from selling you Model 10 when Model 9 is actually the one that's perfect. So, yes. Right. Who else we got? Okay. Um, Thomas again. How is the general build quality of the Steyr compared to the Ge other German brands like Sauer? Or sorry, the German brands, because of course Steyr is Austrian. Like Sauer, Mauser and Blaser. Well, interesting point, because Sauer, Mauser and Blaser have got very widely separated sort of starting prices and although they share a lot of design manufacturing and engineering standards they are very very different rifles um this one if i refer back to my notes this one comes in at 1706 pounds so you're talking mid to top end sour i don't think you could say either one is blatantly better than the other I kind of like some of the characteristic detail on the style, like the spiral barley twist on the barrel, which is the you know, external hammer forging, which isn't present visually on the um, on, on the sour. The magazine system on this is actually very, very nice. I'd love to be able to pop it out, but I'm not going to risk it. This is a 223, and it's actually got a twin column double stack top feed mag on it, which in 223 is quite unusual in a bolt rifle, because even though sour... Um, let me think now, Sal 100 Keeper, I've got one of those in 223, which is a rifle I'm a huge fan of. But that is a still a single column mag, you can't top load it. Both of them are fairly similar if you've got to sort of niggle one in. I think if you've got to niggle in a spare round, the Sauer is a little bit easier because um, the Steyr's got slightly longer before the, the, the round sort of fidgets into the, uh, into, the, into the chamber. But it's very much... I think it comes down very much to the character of the shooter. I would, I'm would, i certainly not feeling un, undergunned with either of them. Uh, I took this one out. This one came last week. I took it out, zeroed it. Um, I'm using this with, um, with a Night Force SHV on it, so it's quite nice to be out with the daylight scope, of course, because I do so much with night vision these days. I've used the PAR 008 LRF. This has got a PAR 007A on it. So it's the rear end add-on. Now... I've always wanted to really give one of these a good go because although there's the slight drawback of sort of some ergonomic compromise because of course you have got physically you know x amount of, of optic or, or digital electronics to fit between your eye and the back end of the scope but the mounting brackets fit well there's no issue with moving zeros or things like that you can click it on and off literally as far as click click off back on three seconds to turn it on that's great and it also means you can put all these collars on different rifles you could have one on your air rifle for ratting you could have one on the rim fire for rabbiting and you could have one on a 223 or a 243 for center fire for, for for foxing the only thing is you know your eye is planted against it 223 it's not really an issue 243 okay it gives you a little bit of a nudge it's not certainly not painful some people might sort of have the old echoes of a flinch come back to them a little bit but um, now, generally speaking, as long as you've got a rifle, and you know, you'll see this one, the scope is, you know, pretty much pushed far, as far forward as it will go. Um, 
if you can push the the sort of the rifle scope to the extent of where you're going to need it forwards for the sort of the most forward prone shooting then by the time you may be out foxing rabbiting off sticks or things like that you are generally a little bit further back anyway off the scope so i haven't found it problematic uh, okay it's not perfect it's not ideal optimum but it's an amazing compromise and it gives you a huge amount of capability because it doesn't matter how much night vision scopes say they're brilliant at long range eh, they sort of are they aren't i'd rather use a regular mechanical i mean a mechanical optical optic sight like this but having that and being able to take it on and off as you please between one two three four whatever rifles for the price of a collar which is uh, about 40 quid the collars wow that's actually quite a thing and okay i don't think i'm going to be popping one of the 306 to go while bore shooting but going between the air gun and the 243 that's a very broad spectrum for the uk shooter so yes i like that i will say i'm going to be adding a bigger illuminator for the foxing stuff though um and and you know the shv night force that's got a turret there uh, and another turret cap there so it, it might just block my beam a little bit but we'll see i've not been out in the dark with it yet mounted on there i had one about six months ago and i never got the chance to put it on a rifle because i was using the double eight anyway i'm wittering now let's have a look at some other questions uh, there might be no one else that's come and uh, come, come and said hello so we shall see yep yeah, that could be it then have we got any more oh here we go here we go here we go right uh -huh. Hi Chris, I've got 3k for a rifle and a scope for shooting on the range and hoping to get into PRS. What are your recommendations? Um, split it in half, spend about 1500 on each if possible. There's lots of great scopes, you know, there's, there's elements there, they've got Night Force SHV. The, the element to, that element Titan, I think, comes in at, I wrote the price down somewhere. Um, 710? Yeah. That's pretty, that's, there's a lot of scope there actually. That's the first focal plane. That one happens to be a minute of angle, but you can have it milli radians. Night Force the same. You can have Hawk scopes I've used. For less than a thousand pounds, then in, you know, in daylight conditions, gives you amazing dialing capability. Uh, I, I'm a milli radians fan, but most scopes these days are available exactly as you want, either minutes or mils. Um, I know Highland Outdoors have done a lot with the Hauer and the MDT range to try and get them within sort of realistic price brackets and there's quite a few rifles you know at £1,500 that um, that will perform better than you can and the point is it's all about learning and it's all about getting used to shooting because I like, although I don't shoot PRS, practical rifle, that kind of thing, it does occur to me that it's so much more about the shooter adapting to the situation than having gun X that will shoot tiny group Y. I am so put off by group, 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 group discussion. And that's not that I don't respect competitions that are based on that between like for like com equipped competitors, but you know, what's the best foxing rifle in the world? You know, what's the smallest group for which rifle shoots this, that and the other? is so open to various everyday influences from factors you know ammunition temperature how slippery are your hands you know are you freezing cold wearing three coats out foxing when you've set the rifle up in you know august with a t-shirt on there's so much more to it and i think prs is pretty much the same um it's about applying yourself so look at the stock options look at the you know things like the howard there are a lot of options um and the problem is if you if you sort of go a bit more than 1500 on the rifle you start spending a bit less on the scope and i would uh, you know if i could if i was if it was my world I, I would probably just spend a teeny bit more on the scope than the rifle but it's all about what you can get what you can feed you know something in 65 creed more one of the six mil cartridges or uh, you know those are the popular things um because they're very good middle of the road for great for ballistics and great for low recoil because uh, you're not really bothered about moderators, you're probably going to be using a brake. Um, you know, look at the mag systems you've got, what, what, what feeding options you've got. And of course, it, it does seem that Highland Outdoors um, uh, and the MDT thing really is sort of trying to rule the roof, certainly in the, in the, in the, um, in the factory rifle market. So have a look at those, because I have shot a few. They're pretty good to shoot. You know, the barrel action is fundamentally good. It's all about which stock suits you best. 
Okay, right. Flatline again. Personally, think the base mode of the Pulsar XP rifle scope models are a little too low at two times base mode. You can mag up to the next level. You know, the XQ spec six times enough for realistic foxes. Yeah, I, I, I'd probably kind of agree with that, but I don't get too hyped up over Pulsar because everything you buy seems to be superseded within about ten minutes. So. Um, Right, Thomas again. This might be a very broad question, but what do you think of Vortex scopes? They're pretty good, to be honest. Um, they give you a, you know, there's there's a pretty wide widespread of of capability and, and and affordability on them. I actually I went to the game fair last weekend, and I saw Country Sports wholesale, and I was just having a look at some of the Vortex, and and I, one of them happened to catch my attention as I was walking past, and as I walked back past. They said, oh, Chris, have you seen this new one? And I said, well, funny enough, that is the one that just happened to catch my attention. Um, I think it was £600. I don't remember the exact specification of it, but it was, you know, all the bells and whistles, the first vocal plane, high magnification. And, and of course, there was a, I think there's a picture of me on Instagram holding it, actually, and I've got, a, I've got it, you know, balanced in front of my eye, elbows locked in. I'm, I'm, I'm looking to it. I'm really looking tightly on the etching, the reticle, things like the chromatics, this, that, and the other. And I was, I was watching way out down to where they were shooting clay pigeons, three, four hundred metres away. And um, it was impressive. It was impressive. And, and if I give you an honest comment, I thought it was an eight hundred to thousand pound scope. And they actually told me it was six hundred quid. And I thought there's a lot of scope there for six hundred quid. So it just goes to show what Vortex have done, but you know, they've, they've brought Chinese optics, Chinese glassware into the modern era, they've got the quality control right, and of course they do offer these warranties, but the warranties now are becoming very popular you buying an insurance policy. Because personally, if you drive over your rifle and smash your scope up, well that's an insurance policy, it's not a warranty, and although it's very nice that that's what you're buying into with scopes like this, you know, I prefer to see the differentiation between what is a warranty and what is an insurance policy. Because a warranty seems like the manufacturer backing up its engineering, whereas an insurance policy is kind of backing up, you know, you. So, have a think about that one. Um, okay. Have a look here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, Nicholas, um, I run a pod on a 6.5 Creedmoor and a light on a 308. Works well with my Delta scopes, less so my Swarov Z6. Really rate the Delta scopes. I had a Delta scope a few years ago and I did think it was quite good for, for, for the price point. Um, I can, you know, my, my number one, there's, there's two things I always think about, well, three things now. I, I always, <laughs> that sounds like a Monty Python thing, but anyway. There's three things I always think about Swarovski. Awesome optical capability incredibly fine reticles, slight confusion between hunting and shooting long range sort of ethos. They're functionally extremely good. Um, personally for me, I, I find the reticles a bit too thin for my eyes now. Um, I'm 43, okay, my eyes aren't quite as sharp as they were when I was 23. But I know that the last time I had the PAR 007, I just put it on the back of a first focal plane hawk scope and I immediately realised that the rear end night vision stuff does not work well on a on a second sorry on a first focal plane scope because really you don't want the, the 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 reticle getting bigger and smaller. I'm not saying it won't work, but it's another compromise you've kind of got to have. And of course on a second focal plane scope, that compromise is pretty much set in the middle of the road and will be there the whole time. Because you can use the magnification of course on the scope and on first focal plane it just seemed a bit tricky using the back end night vision because the reticle was was getting a bit busy or a bit too vacant and okay you can turn illumination on but it's, you know it's a lot to back and thither with and this one i'm just finding life a little bit easier um you know it, it kind of just clicked on and i was shooting straight away and i wasn't sort of fudging around to try and find the, the optimum setting for my eyes so i can imagine the sparo as you say might be straight a bit because the reticle's just a bit too sharp. Fantastic in daylight, absolutely superb in daylight, especially on, on distant shots, precision shot placement, small quarry, things like that. I did um, the DS2 a few months ago, and you know, that's that's everything that's good about Swarovski in terms of that superb precision. 
a range finding you know laser that is, is is so coterminal with the reticle that you can ping out those crows at three four hundred meters where on a regular binocular range finding you'd have sort of this uh, a circle or a square somewhere boxing around them yeah um so that's uh, that's that's my thoughts there really right um okay I imagine on a on a, on a three away, it's starting to give you a bit of a bit of a bit of a nudge in the head, isn't it? So I suppose it depends on what you consider field of view. Personally, I want to see the full screen, and I consider that's what field of view is. But each to their own. Right, city hands up, firecracker. How good of a shot are you? I'm so amazing, firecracker. I am unbelievably good. I can hit everything, no matter how far away it is. Except I can't. I'm just just a regular guy you know probably a fairly all right shot i certainly do enough of it and uh, i don't sort of have any major issues with things like flinching and you know my head coming up and down like a yo-yo like some people tend to have when the you know this trigger goes off head comes up looking for that no i'm all right watch the videos you know watch me shoot see if you think i'm a clown or not it's up to you up to you right uh <laughs> so i'm just gonna say that Thomas put, do you have any bows? Yes. Well, I have one bow left. Yeah, that's, um, archery's my past. It just becomes more and more and more and more of my past now. Um, I was all right, you could say, in the day. Um, and I do still have one bow, but I don't really ever shoot it now. It's, uh, it's, it could probably do some new strings and cables because it kind of sits in my conservatory in the bright sunshine, no doubt. No doubt disintegrating under ultraviolet. Right. Um, uh, you're too insecure. Lovely name. Thank you very much. Um, hi, Chris. Great content as always. What moderator would you recommend or buy for yourself for a 223? Oh, well, there's a lot of great moderators who use DPTs. That's 223, and that's actually got um, a Wildcat Predator 8 on it, which is it's, it's interesting. Actually. It gives you a slightly different noise signature, that um, slightly higher pitched, very little boom, more of a sort of whiz. Um, you know, definitely still very comfortable in the ears. And it's, it's interesting to, to know that sometimes when they get rid of a big boom, you do hear a little bit more of the whiz as the bullet actually flies and displaces the air. But uh, DPTs are good, Wildcats are good. I use a lot of those. Um, I've used so many good moderators, Houskins, um, I don't know, the, 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 na the names evade me. I woke up too early this morning to have a very good memory today. Um, there are some real stinkers, but I've probably forgotten what they are. So you generally only hear me mention rifles that, or, or moderator accessories that, you know, do have some worth in themselves. If it's a stinker, it kind of just gets, it just gets flipped out of the back of my head and I just forget it because what's the point in remembering it? Um... Right, uh, hi, uh, have, sorry, this is Stephen, or Stefan. Stefan, right, uh, have you already shot a CZ457 LRP and what do you think of it? Wow, um, I am Mr. Mr. Echo on this one. I actually, I actually, I had one last year and I actually bought it, I liked it that much. Um, it sat through there in the armory. Um, yeah, it's great, watch the videos, look on my channel. If you go back to sort of October, November time, I think they were, there's a lot of stuff with the LRP. Um, I actually have more plans for it. Funnily enough, the, um, the Element Titan on the FX down here, I don't know if you can see it, it's probably a little bit buried to be honest, but the camera angle is what it is. Um, dare I pick it up? I'm not sure. That is, is, it's got the FX rings on it, which have got elevation adjustment within the rings as well. And I'm kind of thinking I might put that on the LRP. I'm currently running a Minox ZP5, Three to fifteen by fifty. Sorry, three to fifteen by fifty on that. Mainly because it's got absolutely masses of elevation travel in it. I can dial out to four hundred and fifty meters, um, but it's very tricky seeing your impact, even on steel with with a little two two at four hundred fifty meters. Because even though you're tapping it, it's a bit like throwing a pencil at something. The little grey mark left, even on white paint, is, is so minimal. That 15 power, I couldn't see it, so I was relying on where the spot is. Um, yes, so I, I think I might put that on the LRP and give that a go, but you know, time is, is I'm so busy with so much review kit, it, it's it's always a case of, you know, when when do I get a chance? But I do like the LRP a massive amount. I'm not sure I'd buy it now because CZ have come out with some very other interesting versions of the 457. 
I've actually got at the moment the standard 457 for synthetic, 2.2, 20 inch barrel. That thing shoots just as well on target and on steel at 200 meters as the LRP did. The difference being, it's got a slightly mag, slightly higher mag scope on it. I'm running that with, um, I think it's an Element Helix I've got now. It's a 20, so it's a, you know, it's a bit more precise in the aiming solution shooting it. The handling of the rifle, although superb for a sporting uh, rimfire, is less sort of bulky, solid, heavy, and, and, and easy to position and retain position as the LRP. It was really interesting. I was out shooting them um, on Saturday with a good pal of mine, and it was so interesting to compare and contrast two rifles with, the, you know, fundamentally the same action, completely different barrel, different bipods, completely different stocks, completely different scopes. It was so interesting. You know, the LRP has the, the, the larger rubber bolt knob on it as well. It was so interesting to compare and contrast them because fundamentally, you know, they, they show off what I'm always harping on about. Fundamentally, neither is more intrinsically accurate than the other. But fundamentally, they both give such varied ergonomic interaction with the human um, that it was just it was just a really enjoyable afternoon. Sort of, well, I like this about this, and I like that about that. But you know, if I was out rabbiting, I'd want that. And if I was out shooting 500 meters, I'd prefer that stock. So, yeah, that was a really interesting thing. Again, you know. Please like, please subscribe, please click the notification bell, please comment, because if enough people ask for these videos, I will try and make time to, to do them. But, you know, it, it, it takes the best part of a day with good weather to, to, to make, a, to, to make a, a review video. And it can be so hard, you know, you can add another one in. And I've not got a separate cameraman filming me. I'm not being paid by XYZ TV to to do it so it can be tricky and even then you need to get a commissioned film which is going to be of interest to the user so please like subscribe comment and you know click notification bell ask for these videos you know pour it in to one of the, sh the shooting show channels you know there's the shooting show you've got field sport written you've got all these different things tell them if you want to see chris parkin shoot a cz 457 synthetic versus an lrp and discuss all these things which i have a lot of now anyway right uh Right, firecracker again. Uh, can you shoot a deer's nuts off at 400 yards? Very unlikely because I would never try because I'm not a child. Um, pardon me for saying my mind so brutally there, but I'm just not up for playing around with stuff like that. Right, again, not trying to flex. <laughs> to flex. I can hit a coffee can with two to up ten yards. Nah, I can't use scopes. They're no so much to me. My aim sucks, but at least I can get a deer, and that's what counts. That's great, firecracker. Um, you know, wonderful fit. I'm very happy for you. Um, LR stalker. That's a kind of. I presume LR's long range, which is a kind of a. Anyway, stalking's getting close. Long range is staying far. Um, Hello guys, um, is it a Pi 007? Good with scope with parallax. Can I focus picture well? What I'm bushling either. Yeah, um, I, I would think you want with adjustable parallax because you do need that control over it. Um, again, you, you're not said you know what kind of quarry species you're looking at and ranges to them. Um, I would definitely recommend an adjustable parallax side parallax scope because it, it is easier to set up. You can get very very crisp sight picture and of course you don't get the hideous problems with pixelation like you do with a, with, a, with a completely integral low magnification night vision that's then got a lot of digital zoom on it. So there are some big benefits to that slight ergonomic downside and I don't think either one wins outright. I could be suspicious that with a Picatinny rail rifle I could see me very much erring for that. Um, yeah, I, I think that will be the case. Anyway, right. <laughs> David, hi Chris, do you ever do a full review on the Blaser K95 Carbon Kiplauf? Um Did I do a full review on it? I, 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 did, in ride, I, did, I did a written review for it in Rifle Shooter. Um, that must have been about June last year, I think. Uh, I think the only stuff I did on camera with it was I was just adoring the shooting and messing around shooting plates at 200 metres standing up just because it was fun. It's a very, very different rifle and a, and a lovely example of what can be done with the greatest old world 
knowledge of ergonomics and the way the rifle handles and the simplicity of the single shot, the purity of the rifle, versus the ultimate, you know, Blazer engineering standards and the beautiful carbon stock. That carbon stock is a work of art, both ergonomically and mechanically. I think, actually, if I remember it rightly, <laughs> they told me the price of the rifle, and I kind of went, oh, quick, done, photographs done. I send that back because it was, I think it was, was it about twelve or 13,000 quid by the time I had the rifle scope, moderator, sticks, this, that, and the other. Uh, and, I, and I get a bit nervous carrying that much kit around me. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a fine, fine rifle. I did actually put it down as one of my floating five that if money was never an object, I, I, I couldn't not find space for that in my heart. Lovely gun, lovely gun. Right, uh, Kent Davis, your name pops up everywhere, I think. So hello, Kent. Uh, I always enjoy your thoughts. Look forward to many more. I love you too, to LRB. Thank you very much, Kent. Right. Coleman, 18D, any other finds at the game fair? No, really, pretty much nothing. Um, there was the new Howard rim fire, but apparently they're not ready yet. Looked quite nice, handled it. Didn't really see any major sort of glaring faults with it. But um, I'll wait, you know, fully until I see it. Uh, I pretty much dismantled it in the hand. <laughs> I was having, uh, you know, this bit under my arm and that bit there, dismantling it, decocking the bolt, looking at various details and things like, you know, have they left the firing pin? Have they given it a spherical firing pin like Bagara, which I wasn't really a fan of? Or have they stayed with like Anshut CZ World and gone with a chisel tip firing pin, which they have, which means you're probably going to get great ignition. Um, mags look like CZ um, 452357 mags. Um, it, it, it sort of ticked all the boxes. I think the price range looked like they reckoned about 750 street price. So I think it'll be one to look at. It's not quite as deluxe as some of its competitors, but you know, do you want pure functionality or do you want to go a little bit more deluxe? So that, that can be down to you. Other than that, I saw the crispy boots. I didn't see a huge amount that jumped, 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 jumped out at me. I only spent a day there. Um, I'm racking my mind for anything. You know, those, those are really only the three things. There was the, the scope at Vortex. You know, there were bits and bobs. I quite like some of the um, the tree star. I don't remember the name of the company. I mean, I went to look at Tom's targets. They're all, always good stuff. I had a look at some of the tree stands, which were, which were quite nice. I do tend to build my own stuff, though, because I like building stuff with wood. Um, but, they, you know, they look quite nice. They were quite versatile. There were some nice target stands and things like that. I, I'm, I'm so hard to impress, so hard to impress. And I'm used to going to things like EWA where you bring absolutely, you know, absolutely brand new kit this year as the very latest is being thrown at you. And of course, at the game fair, the one thing I really did mess up on is I didn't get to, um, I didn't get to ray trade because I wanted to see the new Weatherby's and I, I, I completely missed it because I was messing around all day trying to find people and trying to get in touch with people, but the phone reception there was, 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 was pretty much zero. Um, and uh, I probably made a mess up there. But yes, I hope to get one of those Weatherby's because they do look quite interesting. Right, who's next? Dave Levine, hi, Kent Davis, Coleman, any good fans again? Michael, um, hi, Chris, great content as always. Do you think the 243 will be redundant shooting deer with lead free bullets? Seen quite a few 243s being traded in for bigger calipers. Um, I can't see a great future for 243, and especially for, you know, if you're in England, maybe not so bad, but if you need to go 100 grains, I think, you know, it's just not going to work for you. And as much as they think they're going to make bullets that are pretty much short and stubby enough to get within the the Green Hill formula and, twi for, ugh, the Green Hill formula and twist rates that will stabilise them, I'm really not sure. And do you know what? I actually get a few rifles come to me these days that won't even stabilise lead, and it's not that they're over-stabilising them, they just won't stabilise them. So, I can't see a great future. The 80 grain GMX I've used quite a lot. They work well, but that's pretty much your limit. And of course, if you go to the heavier bullets, you're gonna physically be going longer, and, and you know, you're gonna lose that sort of, the longer tangent ogives and, and the better ballistic coefficients. If it doesn't matter to you, it doesn't matter. But if it does matter to you, I can see the 6.5. The 6.5 has been pretty much killing the 30 caliber for the last five years anyway. So why it wouldn't continue and carry on killing the um, 
243, I'm not so sure. The slight caveat to that is something like the 6mm Creedmoor is generally being specified with a faster twist barrel. Um, I think I've had a, I think I had one a couple of years ago from Savage in a 7 inch and if the bullets are there that will stabilise heavier copper bullets. But it depends if anybody's making the bullets, if there's demand for them and the prices. And I think 30 cal, 30 cal has always been so easy to feed because it's just so capable, so versatile. So yeah, my feeling might be that 243 might have its days a little bit shortened. Right, Craig, uh, a friend is looking at getting his FAC for deer and foxes. <sighs> Most robes from fallow, I suggested 243, but will 308 be better all rounder? Well, not really for foxing, no, but I, you know, if, if, if he wants that, I, I think he's going to be going 6.5mm, see previous question, because, okay, if he wants it for himself, for himself and, and the deer for himself, and it's, it's not the factor it is if he's, if he's culling or wanting to sell him to the game dealers, but I don't get too involved in all that, because it, it, it generates an awful lot of bad publicity and a lot of people shaking handbags at each other. Um... But yeah, I, I can see 30 cal is always a great choice for any deer stalking. But it's on the it's on the bigger side. If you know if it's urban foxing, 30 cal is getting quite big. Okay, you can still shoot it safely. It's not particularly viciously noisy. But you know, I go for a 6.5. But just I think I own about three or four 6.5s, and I don't even have a 308. Um, so yeah, go 6.5. It's a bit future proof. Right, well it looks like the questions have dried up. We have perhaps reached the end of our interest in me. Oh no, here we are, Thomas is back. Thomas, do you think the 6.8 Western will catch on? It will if you all want something different and go and buy one. It will if the ammunition is easily available. Um, will it be anything ballistically amazing Amazingly different? No, it won't. You, you know, you can't change the laws of physics, and every caliber, every cartridge is somewhere of a of a middle ground between the one below it and the one above it, and all you're doing is filling gaps. So you know, you go from a two to a four. There's a three in the middle, but there's also a you know, one point seven, sorry, two point two five and two point seven five, and etc. etc. So yeah, you can always keep filling the gaps. It's got you know, what's the six point eight? It's um. Is it 6.8 or 270? Or, no, it's, it's 275. It's not like it's anything hugely different, and it's still projecting X amount of lead or copper or lead and copper at Y speed, so it all depends on the availability of the ammunition. Right, what time are we on now? Oh, we've, done, we've managed 8.37. That's actually not bad, because I haven't been on for six, six weeks or so, so I wasn't even sure if anybody would turn up. So thank you for turning up for those who did. Um... I will do a couple more refreshes and see if anybody can pop up at the end, but I think we might be high and dry now. So yes, thank you for watching. Please like, please subscribe, please comment, you know, shout at me, tell me I'm an idiot, tell me I can't shoot the nuts off a deer at 400 yards if it makes you happy. Um, I think another question might have just popped up, but you know, stay involved because... <laughs> If I see the feedback from you guys, it's more inclined to keep me in the, in, in the, in the mood for making videos, and it's, it's, it's good for that. I am sort of, I'm on a bit of a, I, I'm, I'm sort of keeping my, keeping my head down in a way at the minute, because my big video is getting dangerously close to a million views, and I've never been anywhere in that stratospheric ballpark before, so if that makes a million views, I will be very pleased very pleased indeed just not because of you know it makes great amounts of money or anything uh, it's just quite a, a feeling of i've got something right and if not for the viewers at least i've satisfied youtube's algorithms which in fairness have you know been a big factor in that large viewing figure most importantly share my videos with your friends because i would like to hit 10,000 subscribers because as these little iterative stages keep increasing YouTube becomes more worthwhile for me to, to, to get involved in because it's not that I hate doing it. I like doing it. I like the interaction. And I love doing these live videos because it's great to see people feeding back and talking to me. 
I'll give you a factor now, I get more questions on an evening doing one of these than I've had in the whole time I've ever written magazines, which is now 11 years. Readers don't like writing questions back, they like doing it on the internet, especially when they can use a fake name. Um, so let me just catch up a couple of these, right. Thomas, is copper the only alternative to lead? Um, there will be other things. I think Winchester have been doing, with, doing things with scented tin and whatever. So there will be other options. I mean, things like the um, Barnes Varmint Grenades as a, as a varmint bullet have been using scented, uh, scented tin, I think, for, I don't know, more than 10 years, probably. I, once, I had some years ago of those. So there will be other options. You know, metallurgy has always got... Metallurgy is, you know, a bit like cartridges. You can keep alloying things slightly differently. But, you know, you do come back to this fundamental factor that at some point, in just the same way you have to do with shotguns, lead is very dense. We certainly aren't going to depleted uranium. Um, density is great for bullets because it holds its energy and it doesn't, you know, it allows you to maintain great ballistics. And when you are seeking to, to maintain that the physics of that material, it's very hard to maintain the physics of it if you can't maintain density and all the metallic properties of it, and which is why there are many hundreds of alloys and thousands of alloys you know, based on other elements combined. So that's not to say that the job can't be done, and okay, copper might behave slightly differently, but it does work. It's just we all have to slightly re-educate ourselves and evolve towards it. Um, right, were there some more? Right, um, Adrian, as always, really enjoy your channel. Cheers, Chris. Thank you, Adrian. Nice of you. Um... Thomas, when is the review of the Stry coming out? Well, <laughs> we say that. This is going to be hopefully staying with me for a few months. Um, the farmers started harvesting four days ago. I've actually been out today putting up some permanent pigeon hides, uh, which will also make some good foxing hides as well, but they need to sort of sit out there and sort of mulch and rot for a bit, you know, blend in the, the natural surroundings. It doesn't matter how much hessian you wrap around things and fray the ends, it still takes a while. Um, this is going out foxing. I got it zero Thursday, checked out the site, um, gave it a little run in. Interestingly, the Steyr actually says in the manual the way they want you to run it in, and that's very rare for a rifle. So, you know, hats off to you, Steyr, for actually saying that in the manual, which was well written and very, very, you know, very well explained. Uh, and it was a nice sized manual as well. It wasn't sort of trying to read, read, read tiny little figures with a magnifying glass. Um, it zeroed, I've got the ammunition, uh, I was running 55 grain Hornady VMAX through it, uh, I didn't chronograph them, it'll be doing about the speed it says on the box as much as it matters to me, because I'm not going to be some doing some great ballistic experiment with 223 on this, because I'm going to use it for foxing. Um, I'm super looking forward to that, and the point is that that is actually in a way, the focus, pun intended, of my interest in this whole project, because... I can kind of pull the rifle to pieces in 10 seconds before I've even taken it shooting. Shooting's kind of just putting the rubber stamp on it. That does everything I need it to do, and I do it comfortably and confidently with it. So I don't really have any doubts about that. Um, so it's all about this, and that's how I'll be adding, I'll be putting a PBIR illuminator on, on the scope for, um, for foxing with it. So I, I will be feeding back on that, but I suspect it's going to be at least four to six weeks before I've got a really justified opinion of it. Um, most of my fox shooting is done f on foot using quad sticks. So um, probably set a stair. Sometimes, you know, use the, use the tripod, the tripod if I'm a bit more sedentary. And if I'm going in the hide, I've never really gone foxing from hides much. So, you know, that's going to be a bit of a new thing for me. And, you know, putting them all out for pigeons makes them a bit dual purpose. So I'll be doing some of that. So I will be feeding back on that. Um, keep your eyes out for it. What else did we say? Right, uh, da, 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 da. flat line. Fair job, Chris. Answering questions on the fly is something I could never do. Well, you know, um, I, I try where I can. I, I try where I can. Um, people say I'm fairly good at explaining things and remembering things, but you know, there's a there's a million and one details on all the rifles I've reviewed. And someone said. And people say to me, you know, oh, you tested the SAR 100, blah, blah, blah. What length barrels is it available in? Probably 24, maybe, maybe a 22. What calibers? How many mags? And there are a million factors I will never remember. But my whole ethos has always been 
to shoot as many rifles as I can in, can in as realistic a situation as possible so I can give you a bit of my feedback as to how they compare with one another because I'm not interested in telling you why a £4,000 Blaser is better than a £900 Hauer. That's one market, that's another. But, you know, I can, I can compare and contrast. One of the most fun articles I did was about 18 months ago, and I did a compare and contrast on a Hauer 223, my, 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 my mate's rifle, who's been using that Foxing for years, versus the Sal 100 Keeper which I've been using for on and off for about four or five years. Really nice, I, I really like the article. It was one of the few articles that I got quite a lot of feedback on from readers and, and editors. And uh, it was great to sort of compare and contrast the different ways of doing things. But at the end of the day, they both shot just as many foxes. Um, I know which one I'd choose, but I wouldn't say Dave was wrong with what he's got. Um, so yeah, that, that's my ethos really. I, I, I don't want to say, that 4,000 quid rifle's better than your rubbish piece of 900 quid jump, because that's not the case. Because I know for myself, I would rather have a less expensive rifle that will do everything I need it to do that is not going to get destroyed, because I have a secret. Last week, I knocked over a pile of boxes in the garage, and I dropped a gun in a gun case and I thought, oh, it's all right, it just sort of fell flat on the floor. What I didn't account for was the fact a ladder fell over and landed on the box. And although there are no marks whatsoever on the outside of the gun case, or actually no impact marks on the rifle itself, I have cracked completely down the full length both sides the walnut stock of my Varak HW100, which is one of my absolute all-time favourite guns. And I was somewhat angered with myself for that one so it just goes to show and i said i said um i said Do you know what a new stock is x hundred pounds well i'm just gonna beat this one to death until it, it is still in one piece it even held zero but the cracks from the full length of the forehand down to the wrist and um i said Do you know what i'm just gonna keep using it until it actually falls apart because i don't really want to spend half the value of the gun on a new stock you know one day it will come and the point more importantly the gun itself wasn't damaged, and it's like it held zero. The scope wasn't damaged. That's great testament to the gun and the mounts and the scope too. So you've got to take the um, the rough with the smooth, and sometimes you know we all make a mess of things, don't we? So right, Thomas, understand that Seiko S20 is supposed to be the Seiko's new flagship rifle. Do you know of anything new, interesting coming out for its modular system? Oh, Thomas. The Seiko S20 and I have a somewhat checkered history, um, which I can't really talk about because people don't like me for saying what I actually thought about it. And what I thought about it was it was, um, in its own right, it's an acceptable rifle. It's, it's quite a nice rifle. It handles well, it shoots well, triggers good, everything works. But in terms of the modularity of it, I think that's a bit of a... I don't know, is it a white elephant it's called? I don't know, something like that. I just don't really get it because, you know, what's the point of having a target stock with a lightweight 18 inch or 20 inch barrel? And it's, it seemed to be promising a lot in the stock that wasn't being kept up with by the, 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 the metallics. Um, uh, yeah, so, and the magazine was very sticky on the one I had. And I had several magazines for it and it got cleaned and I used all the magazines and none of them were perfectly feeding rounds, so it had goods and bads, and, and uh, um, I don't think it's a better rifle, <clears throat> let's face it, the 85 is not a better rifle than the 75, and the S20 is not a better rifle than the 85. <sighs> My money, I always liked the Seiko A7 actually, that, that was the one I liked the most, but they don't make that now. Um, to, to be fair, my money would still go on the ticker because realistically, they're all made in the same factory. They're just different designs. And although the Seiko has this, you know, the great three-lug bolt, this, that, and the other, and yeah, there are some quite nice handling elements to a three-lug bolt. Well, the T3 has a 70-degree two-lug bolt, which is no slouch in its own right. Triggers are pretty much all the same. Um, and, and the one big thing is that on the 85 and 75, you could top-load the mag in two columns. On the S20, you now cannot. 
So the S20 has no technical magazine loading advantage over the T3. The A7 was interesting because it actually had feed lips on the mag that would spring apart and you could top load that through the, uh, through the ejection port. So is it a step forward? No, I don't think it is. I think it's, you know, it's Cerakote this, it's shiny that, it's just a different, it's like a, a new car. It's, it's a new car. Is it better than the old car? Well, I cast. Do, do they get hugely better? They might get a bit faster. Than, no, I don't think. I, I don't think rifles can achieve anything like cars can achieve in terms of the technological advance we've seen in cars, even over the last five years. Never mind the last fifty years. And are rifles any more accurate now? Well, they're probably a little bit cheaper and a bit more available to be accurate rifles, but they're just made to closer tolerances in factories now. They don't need as much hand finishing and fettling. So there we go. Anyway, right, uh, have we got any more? There seem to be some questions that have been popping up on the iPhone screen, but they haven't quite made it over to the laptop yet where I can actually read them. Um, right, Fabian uh, oh, has retracted his message. Thomas again, I held the S20 in a gun shop. The plastic felt very cheap and noisy, and the modularity seemed quite difficult. Well, I'm not going to disagree with you there, Thomas but they don't like me now, so I won't be doing any more reviews of Seikos and Tikas anyway. Because um, I've paid the price for telling you all the truth. It would appear. And 930,000 of you have watched that video. Uh, right, Darren. Uh, Darren, I'm sure I've, where's your name come from before, Darren? Uh, cry Chris, hope you're well. The blazer duck is happily sat over my reloading bench. Darren, did you, oh you yes, you won the goodie bag, the goodie box from uh, from Sour on my last video, which yeah, it seems like it's absolutely yonks ago now. I'll tell you what you haven't got though. You haven't got one of these. Let me just grab <laughs> I don't actually use it because it blocks my number plate, but I actually put one of the ducks on one of the blazer tail. Um, tow ball thing just because it amused my daughter so I can put that on there um, it does block my number plate though so I don't use it um, yeah so well, I'm glad you like that Darren thank you for coming back and thank you for, for saying thank you it's always good to see some uh, some return visitors and some repeat comment well I think that might round us off quite nicely oh no there's another question popped up what was the other question it's on my phone let me just press F5 there uh, Hernan, yeah, we've you've seen Hernan before. Hey man, do you have any experience with Christensen Arms rifles? Ooh, yeah, um, I had experience with them long before, well, long before Seiko didn't like me. Um, if you want to see the photographs, I'll send you the photographs, but they sent me the all bells and whistles, excellent rifle, and I took the rifle out of the stock and the bedding was just like crumbs. I've had less toast in bed in bed in the morning, less crumbs off a slice of toast in bed in the morning than they were in that stock, and I've got the photographic proof of it. I wasn't particularly impressed with it, didn't shoot particularly well, wasn't really thrilled with that carbon, I think it was a carbon barrel, but the bedding I thought was a little bit insulting, to be honest, because if somebody sold me a, a bedding job on a rifle of that price, Browning do some quite interesting, um, you know, quite, quite simple, but effective bedding jobs on factory rifles, and it does make a a difference. I've had a lot of Browning X bolts that shoot despicably well, and you do the bedding test on them. You know the action stress test, and it's they are they're very good. And when you take them out the stock, okay, it's a bit of hardened bedding under the front bridge and a bit of hardened bedding under the rear bridge. But mechanically speaking, that's all it needs. Okay, it's not the most beautiful job in the world. It's not a hand finished bedding job. It's like a you know, a butter smooth mirror finish like a, a good gunsmith does, which I completely think is a value. I, I think that's an absolutely worth every penny on a rifle doing having a bedding job done on it by somebody who knows what they're doing and why. But in the factory rifle world, functional, I'm happy with it. If it's not the most attractive thing in the world, fine. But that's on a, on a you know, fairly low end factory like rifle browning. The Christensen was an expensive gun and the bedding job looked like it had been. No, it, it, it was not a, a bedding job suitable to a rifle of that value, I'm afraid. Uh, right. Um, uh, right, Thomas again. I've seen videos of the Seiko 85 where the empty cartridges hit the side turret when ejected and Seiko admitted it's a general problem 
on medium and long action rifles. The 85 has, um, that's got a manual ejector, hasn't it? So of course, the speed with which you withdraw the bolt can affect that. I can see that happening. Generally, they only ever send me 243s and 308s, so I'd never really go to the long action stuff anyway. I can imagine that being a factor, but I was never a huge fan of the semi-controlled feed bolt face because I think it has fundamental, the likelihood of fundamental problems with it, not dangerous problems, but just functional problems, are, are there. Because when the bolt slides back, if the cartridge head is not tight under the extractor claw, it can slip down the bolt face and the bolt then comes back and the cartridge is sort of left there at the front of the um, the front of the magazine well sort of half poking in through the abutments because it slipped off the bolt face now that's all very well on a custom rifle or a rifle with you know a nice tight tight claw on the side of the cartridge that's holding it against the bolt face to keep that grip on it but if it's not got that grip on the bolt face the cartridge can fall off and that's a little bit dependent on the relative dimensions of the the, the, the cartridge body and the neck so for example it was on a 243 i had one and as the neck as the body comes out of the chamber and it loses support it drops away and of course the neck isn't really there like left there to support it either these are all very very minor factors but to me that suggests a, a fundamental possibility of weakness with a semi-country control feed bolt face and let's face it all the legendary reputation of control field feel uh, control feed bolt faces pre-64 winchesters etc like that we're talking guns that had an awful lot more hand fettling done to them and not in the modern era of small cartridges either so you always had that slightly more longitudinal um, withdrawal before you lost the support of the chamber itself so um yeah the 85s I've had, other than that 243, have all worked okay, and they've been accurate guns. Uh, I had an 85 Black Wolf that was a 270, I'm not really a 270 fan, but wow, that thing really did just drill holes. Um, but I wouldn't want to be shooting it all day. It drilled, you know, five holes, and then I was done. Uh, right. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Right. Hernan again. BC's way of mechanism works on the Seiko is not a fault just a design feature yeah I'm not I'm, I'm still not fine uh, no problems with the 75 and tickers never show a problem both I'm gonna push feed bolt faces the 85 didn't show a problem sorry no so it's so yeah 75 and ticker are fine the s20 didn't show a problem ejecting the 85 I, I, is what I was just saying about I think I mentioned though you, you know you lose that twin column feed and twin column mag load on the uh, on the s now that seems like a bit of a back back step to me when it was such a selling point of the 85 and 75 um no, right um, david if you want rejection just going back to you Hannah, the, the ejector being located at the six o'clock position yeah th that's a factor but of course it's also a factor that's combined with the actual overall shape of the of the bolt face and where it you know restrains the the cartridge head um darren any recommendations on a deer hunting bullet in 308 mauser m12 so 11 twist i'm just about to start loading for it uh in an 11 twist on a mauser m12 the world is pretty much your oyster um i sort of if you if you're still saying lead um i like the 178 hornady precision hunter which is the eld x bullet I've shot that round in a lot of 308s and it always seems to be nudging up to the top of the, uh, the sort of ladder on, on what shot well through them. You know, there aren't really many bad bullets or bad ammo, just some of them suit rifles better than the other. I like the 11 inch twist. 12 is fine. 150s, 165s, 168s. 10's great. Um, there's not really a problem with it with over you know with a 10 and a 308 but an 11 just seems to fit that lovely envelope of the 168 to 178 those are where i really like in a 308 and a, and a 3006 and i don't go bigger than that until i'm on the 300 win mag so yeah like yeah, try the try the 178 or the um eldx but of course that 11 is going to be a lot more future proof when it comes to copper again 308 is generally not a problem because 
you can run, uh, let me think now, what's a 308? There's a lot of 308s, the 10 inch twist, and you do get some quicker ones as well. So you, so easy to feed at 308. You've got so much variety. Maneuvering space, let's call it. Uh, right, sorry, right, Darren, um, Chris Henry, blah, 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 blah. Thomas again, Chris and Sam's rifle, campfire barrels, don't like cutting hot. Uh, well, have we got more than three hours left, Thomas, to talk about carbon fibre barrels and getting hot? Let me just speak my mind on this one. Um, I don't like combining steel with an insulator on something that's very prone to become problematic when it gets warm with differential cooling ratios, expansion ratio, cooling speeds, expansion ratios. I think you're just entering a world of hurt, to be honest. I'm not saying there aren't places for carbon barrels, but there's none in my armory, armory for a carbon barrel. Not yet, anyway. Right, Chris and Sarah. Uh, yeah, double plunger ejectors on the M18. It shoots them out quick, far. Yeah, I've never had a problem with it with with a sour and Mauser ejecting um, for that reason. It's a little bit belt and braces because tickers don't have a problem either, and it's a very similar sort of principle. Um, Remingtons, although they've been beaten up for years for having that integrated extractor clip that fits in the bolt face, I generally always think that people have broken those. The people have been running over pressure loads, but yeah, there's uh, you won't get problems with Mauser sours, tickers, stuff like that. Some people don't like the fact it dents the case mouth a little bit as it, as it sort of flicks against the chamber wall, but if you're not reloading, who cares? Even if you reload it, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference. Okay, you could say it's work hardening the brass and things like that, but um, there's more to life sometimes. Right, uh, da, 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 da. it sucks to hear that Seiko doesn't like you reviewing that stuff anymore. They should embrace criticism run away from it. Shh. Well, there we go. Right, um, if your unit had problems, that's a fact. It came out of their factory. Well, that's very true. That's very true. I actually had the dealer case and, and I had all you know the various different stock options and this, that, and the other. But you know, if someone like Blaza did a dealer case, well, <laughs> you'd need a three and a half ton dealer wagon for a Blaza because the number of op options that will fit on a Blaza because it's an entirely modular system. And okay, there are some there are, there are some slight dead ends where you can't add X with Y, but the, if you've ever seen a Blaser order book, it's like a telephone directory because there are just so many options and all of them are engineered to work exactly as they should where they should. So that's the that's the the other extreme of a, of, a, of a very wide range of accessories. And okay, you know, none of them are particularly cheap additions, but they're all they're, they're all work as they're designed to work. Right, I think that's it. And if it is it, let's have a look at the time here. Oh, that's beautiful. Two minutes past nine. And another question pops up. Well, we'll see if it pops up there. David, what do you make of the new fad for tripods and saddles? See one behind you. No match for quad sticks, surely. It's not a competition. Um, I found places where I quite like saddles and tripods. I've also used quad sticks for six, seven, eight years. I love quad sticks, um, but I do have, and it, it's all dependent on where you go shooting, because you know I've got various different bits of territory. I don't really ever shoot from the vehicle. I usually shoot from foot quads, or if I'm going sedentary on the ground, I'll use the tripod high seat i'll use the high seat and i'll just roll a jumper up coat up whatever on the, on the rail um i think they've all got they've all got used to say oh you buy this tripod it's going to do everything it's not going to do everything no accessory does every one thing they all have pros and cons and benefits and weaknesses i've got uh, those are the bog sticks which i quite like because they're not super super expensive but the clamp at the top has got these ribbed rubber fins in it so you can clamp it down on the fore end ahead of the magazine, you've still got magazine access, you can clamp it down the forearm, but you don't need to put huge amounts of force on it. And I have had ones where you've got to put a lot of force on them and it, it actually crimps the fore end of the stock and you do get barrel contact. And okay, some stocks are more susceptible than others, but like sporters, didn't like those ones. Um, and the bogs have just been a little bit more delicate in that respect. Okay, they've not got a ball head, but if you set up sedentary anyway, and bear in mind I do a lot of photography and video work, so a lot of the time you're using tripods that don't necessarily have a ball head because you want to use tracking handle this, that and the other. 
So you do have to set up the actual axis perpendicular to the ground anyway, um, which means adjusting one or two of the legs, which is no great hassle if you're going to be there for two or three hours. And again, if it's very dynamic shooting, nothing is going to be faster than quad sticks. They're also lighter. And the big thing with quad sticks is you can use them as a walking aid and you can use them as a glassing aid. Because when you're walking around, these are both sort of hooked on here. If I take them down, probably all the things will fall off. But you can, you know, put your quad sticks down, stand on them, hand on your arm, you know, your hands in your chest there, binoculars on top, a little thermal, you know, etc. So don't just look at what's best. Look at what the benefits are of X versus Y and which one suits you better. I have both. I've got, I think I've probably got I've got at least two tripods and about five sets of quad sticks of various time and iterations. Some of them are sort of sentimental things I've been given. Some of them are the latest and greatest things that I can't even show you on camera because press embargo and this, that, and the other hasn't been lifted on. But I like both because I've got shooting areas where I use both. And they all live in the truck. So I get to Farm X and now I'm going to be out on my foot, out on foot, take the quads. If I'm going to position Y, I think, well, I'm probably going to be waiting there for quite some time. And I want to be able to just put the gun in and just leave it hands free, out the ball, and just know it's going to be fine. And it's going to be pointing approximately where I need to when I get to it. On the other hand, I have got um, quad sticks, I've got the Viperflex, and I've got most of them have got the fifth leg, but I don't always take the fifth leg with me. But on the other hand, if you do want to do the more sedentary thing and just prop them up and leave them with the bolt open and, you know, safe, yeah, the fifth leg's great because you can prop them up. So that's kind of the middle ground. But I don't think they're quite as manoeuvrable as just as a plain quad stick. The fifth leg has got that little bit of extra rattle and rattle and hum, let's call it. Um, right, what we else here? There's a French dude that really liked the 2S20. But he likes all the rifles he reviews. I don't think there's much value in that. Well, you'll, you'll. I review a lot of rifles. I don't review. I review far more rifles written than I do in video format because I've got to do just as much work in the investigation stage. But then to film that. The slightest problem with a rifle makes it a faff and hard to film. And if it's a repetitive issue, like a mag feed issue or something like that, it just doesn't get filmed. I haven't got time. And, and, and the article, you know, can reflect on that without destroying the whole film. So the article tells the facts about of it. And, it, and it's, a, it's much less use of my time to tell those facts as a written article than as a video. And, and all you get in the video is if you show it not working, people... People say, oh, you, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, you didn't do this. It's like, no, I was too busy doing other stuff and I wasn't going to waste my time just trying to, you know, drag the um, the last breath out of a gun that was just hard work to review. And okay, in the end, part X or part Y might get replaced. That can all be compressed a lot more quickly and explained in a written article than going out, waiting for another day of decent weather, the next opportunity to take some long shots or, you know, hammer away, making loads of noise all day with expensive ammunition. If you get ammunition, you know, a mag feed or something like that, or something, you know, three rounds of ammunition that don't group well and three that do, we can write about that easily. But, you know, you've still had to pay for it all and showing it all on video gets very expensive if you have any slight problems. Then there's clouds go past or the sun comes out and everything goes wrong. And oh, yes, it can be fun sometimes. Um, Hernan says, but who knows, maybe all the rifles he gets are good, the French guy. Well, there's good and there's good. Um, you, you tend to get a lot of prototypes and, and a lot of, you know, rifles that have been around and been a bit battered by, by the press circuit. And you know that, that, wouldn't, that that's not something that would have appeared on a new rifle. So you kind of neglect that, you know, you negate that, you can rule it out because you know through experience... Manufacture X don't send you junk, don't send junk rifles to the shops, they don't send them to customers. But when a rifle's been around 10 journalists or on a media day and absolutely rattle to hell, then yeah, they can start showing them showing rough, rough edges on them. But that's not the new rifle, and that's a rifle that's been heavily battered by people who 
I would say don't care about it, but aren't interested in the necessarily long longevity of the gun. So rifles like that don't look great on camera, and it doesn't show well. But that's not to say the new rifle won't be good. Um, and I know, you know, I know if I get a rifle with a huge scratch on the barrel that someone's done, that's not going to have come from the factory. That's not how it's supplied. But it doesn't affect me actually giving it a technical description in an article. And I know that wouldn't be there. But in a video, we all that scratch. It must be rubbish. They must have rubbish quality control. It's like, no, I've just been given a rifle that's been well used. It's just that they're using second hand rifles. So, um, oh, I guess the S20 is a litmus test for rifle reviewers. Well, let's just say I often look in quite hard when I see other rifles reviewed and look at the serial numbers because, like I've just said, you know, the same ones can go round and round and round. Chris Cato, hi Chris, Chris Cato, Chris, Chris, hi Chris. Too many Chris's. I've got loads of friends called Chris as well, so it can be Chris, Chris, and Chris. Uh, right, hi Chris, just bought a set of the Blaza 2.0 sticks. Really good sticks, hold the rifle really well. The thing I, I had some Blaza sticks at about 18 months ago, I do quite like the fact you can kind of steer the front end, which is, it is super precise, but, uh, you know, I won't say it's the, the, the definite factor for me. It's a nice function, but. You know, I like I like vibe effects as well, um, but it's an interesting factor. Right, I really am going now because it's ten past nine. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for your questions, and um, thank you for your continued support of my channel. Please like, please subscribe, please comment, and please share it with your friends because the more subscribers we get, let's be honest, I I, I get a few more shekels from uh, from from YouTube and mainly Pulsar, who love to advertise on my videos, who don't send me stuff to review themselves because I don't generally say the wonderful things some people say about them. Um, so there we go. Right, well, it's ten past nine GMT time, so I think I'm going to go inside and have a cup of tea. Um, everybody, look after yourselves, stay happy, good shooting, good hunting, and enjoy life, and just be nice to people. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. I shall stare purposefully at the camera there and then I shall walk over to it, huddle around my bench and turn it on. Right, cheerio.